Clear Creek. We're glad you're here this morning, and it's good to, to have all of you here and to worship God together uh, and sing praises. Thank you for everyone who's participated in the worship so far this morning, and we're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in our midst as he promised that he would be with us as we met together this morning. This is, is an, a great weekend. It is Memorial Day weekend, and uh, as we always do on every Memorial Day and Veterans Day, we'd like to recognize some very special people. Uh, if you're in the audience and you ha are serving or have served or have family serving in the armed forces of the United States, we want to ask you to stand up so that we can honor you. All of you who have served or have family serving. And this is the very first time that we've been doing it that we had someone actually in uniform. That was pretty cool. So uh, we're, we're glad Dave's with us this weekend. We're glad that you were able to come home before you get shipped out. So we're, we're glad that you feel like this is home. Uh, also, we want to remember in prayer the, the people who have uh, endured that tragedy in Oklahoma. And we know that there are a lot of people who are hurt and uh, many have been found dead and have lost everything. We want to continue to to pray for and minister to, to those people. We hope that you were able to contribute this morning, and if not, if you uh, have something later in the week, I'm sure you can contact the office and they can tell you uh, how you can uh, contribute to that fund. This morning, before we begin preaching, let's, let's bow together in a word of prayer. God, our Father, we're grateful for the opportunity we have to serve you. We thank you for the opportunity and blessing that we have to um, uh, to worship you this morning. Father, we know that uh, you're in our midst, and we pray that as we study this next story of anonymity, that we'll find hope and encouragement, and we we'll see how your plan works in even uh, the, the most anonymous person. Uh, Father, we're thankful that you forgive us. We're thankful that you love us. And we pray that you'll continue to watch over us as, as your church and that we can turn this community upside down in you and your son's name. And it's in his name we pray. And amen. Good evening. We begin tonight with a rare look inside Anonymous. They're this shadowy and motley group of activists who answer to no one. Well, now, now they're evolving into this movement of social change, a, a real driving force. And one of the questions we're asking is, who are these people and why are they taking to the streets? We're doing a series called Anonymous, and the reason we're doing the series called Anonymous, it's kind of a theme that we've had this spring, if you've been with us. We believe that there are many wonderful stories of Jesus uh, throughout the New Testament, but we also recognize that as Jesus worked in the midst of, of these people, that the people all left Jesus with their own personal narrative of what went on. Last week we talked about uh, the four men who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus as he was teaching and they couldn't get into him so they dropped him, dug a hole in the roof and dropped him through the roof and that Jesus saw their faith and healed their friend. Uh, I called them wingmen, the guys that it was all about someone else. They were just willing to do whatever it took to bring someone who needed Jesus to Jesus. Uh, this week... We've got another story that I'm entitling Hope. It's a wonderful story, and you're going to find it in the book of Mark, chapter 5. And we're going to read verse 21, and then we're going to skip to verse 25 and go through verse 34. It's an extensive reading. Now, what's happened here is Jesus has come uh, on the other side of a lake. He has traveled into this area, and people knew he was coming. And so this huge crowd had gathered. And here's where we begin in verse 21. When Jesus crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, 
And so he stayed by the seashore. And we skip down to verse 25. It says, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt her, that in her body, and she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had proceeded from him and had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And as his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. This is a cool story. It's a story of a woman who had endured a great deal. She was imprisoned in her body. For 12 years, she had, she had, uh, had this, this hemorrhage of blood, and she was weak, and she was beaten. And not only on top of that, she had been disappointed time and time and time again. In this society, someone with this type of disease was considered to be unclean in society. She was one of those people that couldn't be touched, and she had to be held at a distance. And for her to come and see Jesus and be willing to fight through a crowd and touch him took a great deal of courage. This is a woman who had one last hope. Hope's an amazing thing. It's a great thing. And it's something that in every Christian fuels us to move on to the next phase of our life. Hope is something that God places within our hearts. And it creates boldness within us. This morning, i got a few things I want to talk to you about. Considering hope and how it, it plays into the life of not only this woman and another story I'm going to share with you, but also in disciples like you and me. Plain old people. Plain old people doing plain old things, living plain old lives. And how God can take this hope, place it within us, and do some pretty amazing things. First thing I want you to see this morning, point number one, is that hope always involves risk. Now, I've got three movie clips this morning I'm going to show you, and let me preface this by saying, when I show a movie clip in here, I do not endorse the movie. It's used, used strictly as an illustration. This is a movie that I have to be honest, I've only seen on television, it's been edited, and it's still uh, a relatively violent movie, so I don't recommend it for families. But there's some points in the end of this movie and in this storyline that I think kind of parallel this story of this woman. It's a story of two men who are in prison. And it's set in the, in the 20s and 30s, and there was one man named Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins. The other's name is Red Redding, played by Morgan Freeman. And, and in this first clip, Tim Robbins had been put in solitary confinement. He had just gotten out, and the reason he was placed in solitary confinement was because he had snuck into the warden's office, taken the PA system, and played music for the entire prison. When they finally broke in there, he was penalized. And now he has gone back to eat with his friends that he had made in the prison. And he starts talking about what music meant to him. Will you roll that, that footage for us, please? Haven't you ever felt that way about music? Well, I played a mean harmonica as a younger man. Lost interest in it, though. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a... there's something inside that they can't get to, that they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? Hope. Let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope 
and drive a man insane. And in red storyline here, his hopes were small. When he first went to prison, his hope is that he would survive the first night. And time and time again, when he met with the parole board, his hope is that he would get out of prison. And time and time again, he had been disappointed. Time and time again, the parole board had told him that he had not been rehabilitated, that he would have to stay in this dingy, dark, horrible place. And every time he got his hopes up, his hopes had been dashed to the point that when someone says, there's a part of you that is inside of you that people can't take away, and it's hope, he looks at him and he says, let me tell you something. Hope's a dangerous thing. And I tell you this morning, hope is a dangerous thing. You see, when we have hope, we always run the risk of being disappointed. We look in in Mark chapter 5 at this woman's story. We look back in verses 26 and 27, and we see these things in her story. She had endured much at the hands of many physicians. There are so many people who have gone through illnesses and sicknesses. Last week, we we had uh, Mother's Day. We talked about those who were attempting to have a child and, and were doing everything they could and the pokes and the prods, and they had endured so much to no avail and time and time again been disappointed. This woman had endured much at the hands of physicians. Not only that, she had spent all the money she had, every resource she had, she had invested in trying to get well because she was tired of the disappointment. She was entirely of the embarrassment. She wanted to see a breakthrough. She wanted to be whole. Not only that, but she wasn't helped. But rather, instead of being helped, she had grown worse time and time again. This woman would continue to get her hopes up, and yet she would continue to be disappointed And as we go into verse 27, we find that she had one last hope. After hearing about Jesus, a story of this Nazarene carpenter who was a rabbi who could heal people, she came up in the crowd behind him and she touched his cloak. She had one last hope. And she was willing to take it. But even now, hope was risky. You know, we've read this story time and time again, and seldom do we ever put ourselves in this woman's place and realize that she was running up behind this Jesus, not knowing how it would turn out. She was running up behind this Jesus. She believed something good was going to happen, but she didn't know what was going to happen because she had been disappointed time and time and time again. And what she was about to do in the middle of this crowd was incredibly risky. How about you? Is there a part of your life where you need healing or being made whole? Uh, Maybe there's a problem in your life, whether it's a financial problem, an emotional problem, a relationship problem, whatever it is. Is there something in your life where it's time for you to take a risk and allow Jesus to take over that part of your life? I can tell you it's going to feel risky. There's going to be a part of you that's going to want to straddle that fence. And you're going to be faced with a choice that is a, is, is a very difficult choice because it's a choice between fear and faith. Sometimes it's easy to, to fall prey to fear and say, you know what, whatever it is, I'll just tough it out and I'll just deal with it. Or you can hand it over to Jesus and experience incredible freedom. But it's risky. There's a part in us that always will say, you know, I might get disappointed. But we also find out that faith doesn't disappoint. You know, tribulation is put in our life for a reason. We, we turn to the book of Romans chapter 5, and we look at these, these scriptures in verses 3 through 5. It tells us, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance or patience. And perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, tribulation, hardship, all the things that are in our lives have been given to us so that we can work ourselves to the point and allow the Spirit of God to work within us to where we recognize that in Jesus Christ we have incredible hope. There's no situation that he cannot redeem. You see, hope always 
always involves risk. But the next thing I want to show you this morning is, you know, as struggles create opportunity for God to work, hope also escapes the double-minded. In this next clip I'm going to show you, Red is, uh, what has happened is Andy has escaped from prison and gone to Mexico. And he, on his way, he leaves the letter for Red saying, if you ever get out, here's a place I want you to go, and I'll have something for you there. Red has been released from prison by the parole board. He's living in a halfway house, and he's finding that freedom, or this kind of freedom, was not what he dreamed. He was disappointed uh, in, in where his life was leading him and how he was being treated. And so he decides that he would follow Andy's instructions, and he would go to this place to see what Andy had left behind for him. Dear Red, if you're reading this, you've gotten out. And if you've come this far, maybe you're willing to come a little further. You remember the name of the town, don't you? Say what to nail. I could use a good man to help me get my project on wheels. I'll keep an eye out for you, and the chessboard ready. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you, and finds you well. Your friend, Andy. This character had been released from prison, yet he was still imprisoned. Because what he had hoped for had not turned out to be what he expected. And so he's faced with a choice. He can either take a great deal of risk and live a life of true freedom, or he can continue in the path that he is already on, a path of disappointment, a path that really isn't freedom. In our story, this woman faces the same choice. Now, we've talked about what was going on in her life. This, this, uh, the King James calls it an issue of blood. The New American Standard calls it a hemorrhage. And, and NIV calls it bleeding, whatever it is. What has happened here is it has created someone who, well, she was free, but she wasn't able to enjoy all of her life. She wasn't able to have a normal life. And she'd been disappointed at every turn, but now she was at a point where she was saying, I want real life. Isn't that what Jesus said to us in John 10, 10? I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. And this is a woman who had heard those words and she wanted full life. And so she makes a choice. She does the same thing that Red does. Red has to make a choice. Am I going to take a risk and be all in? Am I going to set a course and be committed to that course? Or am I just going to back away from my dream? Am I going to back away from real life? And this woman, as she stands and she sees this crowd around Jesus, and she knows that she's going to have to fight through this crowd, and she knows what people are going to think, and she knows that a woman shouldn't touch a man, and she knows when she gets in the middle of this thing that, that something may not happen, but she has decided, this is it. This is my course, and I'm going to be committed to it. I'm all in. I'm going to take action. And you know, we have to be the same way. You know, so many times we want to straddle the fence. Sometimes, so many times we back away in fear. But when it comes to trusting Jesus with whatever is going on in our life, when it comes to trusting Jesus with our hope, it's easy to back away. It's easy to be double-minded. It's easy to play it safe. But with Jesus, you can commit with Jesus, you will not be disappointed. With Jesus, you can experience boldness if you are willing to be all in, 
to trust him with everything. Cast, his, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. James chapter 1 James writes these words, very practical words, uh, about how we are supposed to be people of hardcore, straightforward faith. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And what James is saying, he's saying, you know, when we're going to trust in Jesus, when we have this hope that's burning within us, and whatever it is in your life that, that needs to be cast upon Jesus and you need him to work in your life, you have to be committed you have to act in faith. You have to be, as our culture calls it, all in. Because when we are all in, he has a way of acting in our lives in ways that are beyond our imagination. You know, we're told that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think. And I don't know what your imaginations are considering what's going on in your life, but I can tell you he can do more than you imagine. I love these words. It's in the book of 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. And it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we have set before us. For he who promised is able to deliver. Isn't that comforting? When we start having hope of what God can do in our life, what, what Jesus will do for us, that we can be unswerving and have a hope knowing that he can do everything that he promised. And this God that we worship, this Savior that we worship, is able to work beyond our wildest imaginations. The thing I love about this woman, before we go on to our last point, I love her recklessness. I love the fact that she chose a course of action and she recklessly pursued it. Very seldom in this life do we find people with that kind of faith. But there may be people here, you're, you're on your last leg. You, you've been disappointed time and time again, and now it's time to choose that course of action and to pursue Jesus recklessly. I, I had a friend that uh, years ago, that you could tell in her life there was this hole in her life. And she was constantly trying to fill this hole in her life with, with many things. And she would use a materialism, a bigger house. She had a boat on the lake. It was too big for the lake. Uh, she, she had cars. She had all these things. This materialism, she was trying to fill this hole because she wanted to feel valued. And for her, it became relationships. One relationship after another relationship after another relationship. One job, one promotion, one promotion after another. And she was trying to fill this hole in her life. And this hole was, she was looking for meaning. She was looking for value. You know, we find our value in Jesus. That we have a God that loves us so much that he would rather allow his son to die than for him to live without us forever. But in order to pursue that Jesus. It'll escape us if we're double-minded. And, and the last thing I want to show you this morning in, in this scripture is, you know, in Andy's letter, he said that hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things. This last point is that hope is a good thing, but it's not the best thing. Because there's more to this story. We, we find in the next clip I'm going to show you that Red is out of prison. He's read this letter, and he's decided that he will recklessly pursue a bigger dream, a bigger hope. Fort Hancock, Texas, please. I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still a whole of thought in my head. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel. 
A free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. There's been a transformation take place in the existence of this character. See, his first hope was to make it through the night. His next hope was to make it out of prison. His next hope was to have some kind of life that he was not experiencing. And what happened is that when he really, truly chose real freedom, his hope changed. He received a new hope, a better hope, a more powerful hope. And I look at this woman's story you know, through all the disappointment and through, through the courage it took to do what she did, we look at verse 34 and we see how Jesus responded to her. He said, and he said to her, daughter. And when you see daughter in, in the New Testament, you see Jews use the word daughter. That is the greatest term of affection, like child or son or daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You see, the, the moral of this woman's story is not healing. You know, usually we, we read this story and we think, wow, what a nice tale. A woman was sick. She touched Jesus. He felt it. And now she was okay. It's bigger than that. If that were just a story, it almost wouldn't be worth the ink that it took to, to, to print it because Jesus healed many, many, many people. He could have healed everybody had he chosen to do so. But see, this story is about something bigger because he didn't just give her healing. He gave her something she had never experienced ever in her life. He gave her a, a gift that brought with it a bigger hope. Because you see, if you go back and look at this, it wasn't about healing and it wasn't about hope. This story is about transformation. You see, discipleship is all about transformation. It's about moving through stages in our life and being transformed and changed. You know, we're not to conform to the world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And what happens is, is when we put our trust in Jesus and we allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives, there is a transformation that will take place in our life. And it won't just be healing. It won't just be blessings that we count to be big blessings. But what happens, he changes us from the inside out. And if you look in this verse of Scripture, in verse 34, you're going to see that he didn't just heal this woman. He gave her peace. You've probably read over it two or three times and never really noticed that. You say, oh, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And this is a woman who had never in her life, especially the last 12 years, experienced peace. For it, it was joy. For this woman, it is peace. For many of us, it may be something different. But what happens is, is that there's a transformation that took place here in her life, and there's a transformation that takes place in our lives. When we're willing to overlook the risk, when we're willing to be courageous enough to commit and to be all in for Jesus, there's a transformation that takes place. And here's what God does. Whatever your situation is, wherever you are in your journey, here's what God does. He tears us down and he builds us back better. And then he'll tear us down again and he'll build us back better. And what happens is he continues to chip away and chip away, and in us, he creates a clear image of Jesus for the world to see. And when we will ignore the risk, and when we will commit to being all in for Jesus, what will happen is this. At some point, this transformation is going to be so great that people will know Jesus because they know you. How incredible is that? What a wonderful gift from God that people can know Jesus because they know us. Flawed people, failed people, imperfect people, ordinary people, anonymous people. 
Because I'm a firm believer that the plan of the church is that if a multitude of people who are anonymous do small, meaningful things in the name of Jesus, you will have a greater effect than just a few people doing great things. He's going to work through you. He has a plan for your life. Ignore the risk and commit. I want to read it as a form of invitation from the book of Matthew, chapter 12. It has to do with hope because there are many people here that, that are still in this hope stage. They're still waiting to, to commit. They're still waiting for something else to go on in their life, and they're waiting for that breakthrough, whatever that breakthrough may be for you. And I want you to see these words. They actually come from Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. But it says this, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he'll not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, all the nations will put their hope. And he's saying this, you may feel beaten like an old reed. I don't know if you've ever seen a field of reeds, but when one is bent over and, and bruised and it has probably been stepped on or, or run up against and it's just taken all the battering it can take and it's bent down. And maybe in your life you've had this great flame for God. You had this great fire within you, but because of circumstances and because of choices, it's just smoldering. I want you to know that we have a Jesus in whom we can put our hope that he will hold that reed up. And then if your flame is just smoldering, he'll place the hands that created this world around it. And he will gently breathe life back into that flame. You see, we have someone we can trust in whom we can really put our hope we can experience a transformation just like this woman. And her story serves as some great, encouraging, inspirational words to let us know who our Jesus is. I encourage you to overlook the risk. I encourage you to go all in. I encourage you to allow Jesus into your life so that he can transform you so that you can be usable in his kingdom and that people can know Jesus because they know you. That's what our invitation is this morning. If you have need of the church for the prayers or, or if you would like for our elders to pray with you, they'll be in rooms A5 and 7 across the hall. They love you. They want to serve you. And if you'd like to begin your journey with Jesus, we consider that journey to begin at baptism. So if you'd like to be baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life, we invite you to do that very thing this morning while we stand, while we sing to encourage you. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your age.